Good afternoon. Today we are going to look at the long fall in the third. Now, as always, I'm going to try to start with a story. There are many ways to mark time in England, and yet the calendar of the years of this king or that king were not that important. More important was the sacred calendar and the seasonal calendar. See, these represent the habitable and unchanging nature of the world. They express a deep sense of belonging to the land itself and to God as well. Now, at the time we're talking about, which is uh, the Middle Ages, winter lasted from Michaelmas on September 29th to Christmas. And that was the season when you sowed wheat and rye. It was known as the winter seed. Some of the cattle would be removed from their summer pastures to the stalls, and the rest were butchered in November along the pigs in a month known as Blood Month. What was not eaten was salted. Christmas lasted 12 days, and it was the only long holiday that everyone could enjoy. It was a time of eating and drinking and watching the plays of the, 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 of the religious sects. Spring lasted from January 6th to the Holy Week of Easter, and during this time the man would set the vineyards and make the ditches, they would cut wood for fences and plant the vegetable gardens. The first Monday after Epiphany was known by the woman as Distith Monday, and by the man as Plow Monday. The woman would spend the day spinning wool, and the man would be spending the day in the fields plowing. There's also a tradition on Plow Monday. Young man would drag a white plow covered by ribbons through the local village. At every door, they would stop and ask for pennies, and if refused, they would plow the ground in front of the cottage. Now, they were led by a young man dressed as an old woman who called himself Bessie, as well as another man who would wear a fox skin as a hood with the tail hanging behind his back. Now, this ancient ceremony was still being performed in the early 20th centuries, and in places, it is still practiced in England. February 2nd was Candle Mass. It commemorated the purification of the vir Virgin, and is used as a time for tillage to be resumed, for oats, barley, and beans to be sown, and trees to be pruned. From Hocktide, which is the second Monday after Easter, to Lamas, the first day of August, it was summer. On Hocktide, the females of the village would capture and tie up as many men as they could find until the man would pay a ransom. And the next day, the man would get to do the same with the woman. Festival days were important breaks because throughout the year, serious hard work was done. From sunup to sundown, you hardly got a break, if ever. So when you had these days, you would celebrate. Now, during the summer, season, again, which is pretty much what we'd call late spring throughout the summer. The man would lay down the manure, they'd cut more wood for winter, and they'd shear the sheep and clear the land of weeds and repair fences and rebuild the fish, weirers, and the mills. The fields, then when laid fallow, were then plowed. June 24th is midsummer, as well as the Feast of Nativity of St. John the Baptist. The evening before, June 23rd, therefore, the boys of the village would collect bones and other rubbish and burn them, and then they would make brands and walk around the fields with these brands, as well as setting a wheel on fire, which they rolled in front of themselves. The next day, June 24th, the harvest of hay would be brought in and stacked before a sheep was let loose in the field, and the sheep was the prize of whatever mower caught it. Now, after this section of the year, the wheat would be harvested, the cows would be allowed out to graze on the stubble, and the fields that had been laid fallow for the year would have rye and wheat sowed in them. And following this ritual, there would be a feast of seed cake, pastries, and a dish of milk, wheat, raisins, and, sp raisins and spices. Then the sheaves of harvest were threshed and winnowed, and the whole year began yet again. Never really ending. Every year, every day, the same as the day before or the year before. Now, last time we talked about how with King John dead, the First Baron's War ended, how Prince Louis of France was forced to flee England at their large bribe. 
When Henry was crowned king as a minor, he swore to uphold the Magna Carta and rules placed in the hands of Regency Council, which could get which could not get along. And so while managing to bring order back to England, they fought among themselves for power. And we talked about Henry and his character from being extremely pious and a fool, really, some thought, to wanting to be remembered as a king of peace, and yet, like all Plantagenets, he was a man of anger. But he's the most lavish patron of religious art in all of the history of England. He's responsible for many of the glories of England that we see in the buildings today. And we talked about how Henry fell into the sway of foreigners from the Putu, as well as family members of his wife, Eleanor. And we looked at how, despite the Plantagenet Empire being broken, England never had seen such prosperity since the days of Roman England. And finally, I talked about how the nobles of England didn't trust Henry because of his association, association with foreigners. And since Henry kept asking for money, which was used to pay off his friends, the barons eventually forced Henry to rule under a council of 15 men nominated by the barons, with the bar parliament choosing the chief justice, the chancellor, and the treasurer, and holding the great seal, so Henry is effectively a minor once more with no say of in the government after 31 years of being king. Now, this government of the barons collapsed in 1261. A papal bull was published, which released Henry from any promises made under duress to the nobles, and Henry announced that the barons had stripped him of his power and dignity. He then quickly moved to the Tower of London to use his defense against his enemies and as a symbol of his power. But Henry <laughs> was stupid. He had not learned anything. In his two years, he went way, right back to governing as he'd always did. He gave power to the foreigners, this time focusing on the civil yards. And this time, he only lasted in power for two years before once again his favorites declared as being overmighty, and Henry, who had hired a body of foreign mercenaries as bodyguards, ended up spreading rumors that he was planning to lead an invasion of England and kill all the nobles. So, in 1263, the barons found themselves a new leader to press their claims and demand that they should only be governed by native-born man. It's interesting. The man they chose was a man named Simon de Montfort, who sailed to England. Now, he's the first ever leader, it's been said, of an English political party, but he's an odd representation of the English cause. He was born in France to noble French family. He had native connections, okay. He had inherited the Earl of, Earldom of Leicester, of Leicester, because his grandfather had married the sister of the last Earl. And he'd also married Eleanor, this Eleanor being the sister of El Henry III. So I'm sorry, a lot of names, just go along with it, okay? Anyway, so he, the shield and defender in English, his enemy and expeller of aliens, was alien and a foreigner. But the Baron summoned him to St. Alburn's and they met there, and then ignored the king, who had called them to meet in Windsor. Now, there's a fight brewing between Henry and Simon, and it can be not be held off forever. De Montfort was an obstinate and intolerant man. He obsessively hated the Jews, and he obsessively hated heretics. He was an isolated figure in England. He did not like compromise. He did not like the way his English supporters were hesitant to fighting. He thought they were fickle and disciple. He did not abide fools. He was high-handed in his manner and his methods. To use a term in contemporary society, he was a bully. He had a belief. This is right, and what's right needs to be done to make things right. Now, he had a resume that included leading an army on crusade, and Henry had once sent him to Gascony as his vi viceroy. The king was known to be fearful of storms. So it's thought to be a telltale sign of how simple Henry was yet at one point to tell Simon, I fear you more than all the thunder and lightning of the world. Now, de Montfort was a very self-righteous, and because of this, he's able to conceal, even from himself, his true purpose. Like the rest of his family, he wanted power. And the only way to get this power was to gain honor. And the only way to get the honor was to show himself a strong, moral, religious man. See, he knew God was on his side. And if he won, the question was, would he allow Henry to live under the baron's control again? Or would he kill Henry and take the throne personally? 
As soon as de Montfort arrived in England, both sides began to fight each other on occasion, but mostly they used other weapons besides swords. For the first time in England, they used propaganda with open letters to shire courts and sermons in churchyards. In fact, the political ballad appears during this period. But the War of Words became a war of blood in the spring of 1264, on a scale not seen since King John and the First Baron's War. The peace that Henry had desired was snatched from him. See, he had an uneasy relationship with his eldest son and heir Edward, since Edward was stronger and braver than his father. But Edward told his father, the king, that you had to do something, Henry. And so Henry marched at the head of his army to Northampton, bearing the royal standard of a red dragon with a fiery tongue, a sign that no quarter was to be given to the rebels who dared to surrender. The king captured the town and of Northampton, and Edward then went on, went on to pillage rebel lands in, Straf in Staffordshire and Derbyshire. And then de Montfort captured London, where he sat. But he knew he could not emerge out of the city, for the king had the larger army. But decisive battle could not be avoided, for otherwise the administrative administration of England would die a thousand cuts. So on May 12, 1264, Henry and his army marched to the Clunic Priory of Lewis in Sussex. The Baron's army was only 10 miles away to the north. Now, for two days, both sides took part in inconclusive negotiations, but finally de Montfort moved forward to the high ground that overlooked Lewis. The armies faced each other, and the battle began. Now, at first, it appeared that the royal side was winning. Prince Edward attacked right in the middle, the group of London militiamen, and he managed to break them, and he chased them for hours. But this proved to be a huge mistake, because while he's gone, the rebels trapped Henry inside the priory. Now, de Montfort was willing to grant talks, so armistice was quickly arranged. Lord Edward was sent to Dover Castle, and he was held as a hostage for the king's good intent. Now, this is a victory for the side of the barons, but the question remains, how did it affect the little people? It seems, based on the evidence we have, the evidence of poems and the evidence of songs that are written soon afterwards, that the people had joined the barons in their struggle. They saw Henry as something of an ogre. There are hundreds of villagers fighting on the side of the barons besides the mountain knights, and most of them were so poor that the only weapons they had were knives and scythes. If you ask them, they would say they were fighting against the king's exactions, the king's taxes. In the early 19th century, pits were uncovered in Lewis, which held about 500 bodies each, piled on top of each other, the unmourned and unremembered casualties of war. But we'll go back to the big people now. After his defeat, Henry III is taken back to London, where he was held under guard at St. Paul's Cathedral. A small body of nine barons, led by de Montfort, assumed power where all the departments of state continued to operate under the legal fiction that the king was still sitting on the throne. But there was a king on the throne, but it wasn't Henry. It was Simon de Montfort in all but name. He's the first person in English history who managed, as a subject, to seize the throne from the rightful sovereign. One of his first acts was to seize the lands of 18 barons who had fought on the losing side and take the lion's share of the ransom money. He even turned on his fellow barons. He sent one of them to prison and forced another into exile. He was a tyrant. But that's what happens in really Oligos. And yet his support is soon fairly weakened, for who would not want a king? instead of a tyrant. So searching for support, de Montfort called, called two parliaments. One parliament held representative, rem, representatives, yeah, sorry, representatives of the towns as well as the knights and lords present. King Richard I and King John had formed a community in towns and villages who now looked outside the small little world and wanted to help rule. And the weakness of Henry III we have what will eventually become the House of Commons, although it's not going to be called that for many years. Now, I want to kind of talk about something here. There's always been parliaments of some kind in England, and the structure itself has existed before the moment it reached self-consciousness and called itself a parliament. 
Now, historians cannot be 100% sure, but it's assumed that the tribal chiefs had councils and a wise and noble man whom they turned to. We know the Saxon invaders brought to them the idea of the Witten, which means the knowing, and the Witten, Wittengemont, which means the assembly made up of bishops and lords who met twice a year and who were consulted by the king and deliberated upon the making of new laws and the raising of new taxes. They even had the power to elect and depose kings. Now the Normans, after 1066, they established their own council, a small body made up of about 35 ecclesi ecclesiastical and secular lords. In 1095, William II, the Rufus, or the Red, called together a larger assembly made up of all the abbots, all the bishops, all the chief men in England, which became the template for the council of the later Norman and Plantagenet reigns. Now, during the reign of Henry II, the abbot of battle declared that the king could not change the laws of the country without the consent and counsel the barons, although all the Plantagenet kings, they kind of tried their best to kind of sweep that idea under the rug. Most of them to the chagrin. The first official parliament in English history, however, was summoned by King John in 1212, made up of all the sheriffs of every county, along with six knights of every county who was to meet him, not to advise him, mind you, to simply communicate the royal will to their respective homes. But the provisions in the Magna Carta in 1215, three years later, stated what powers the king had and what powers the king did not have, and what powers he did not have were given to the parliament. For instance, only the parliament could levy taxes, even though the parliament at this point is only made up of nobles and knights. Now, Henry III called his first parliament in 1236, but the parliament at that time, again, was made up of bishops and lay nobles. No representatives, representatives, represent, I can't pronounce the word today, representatives from the shires or towns allowed. But the king needed money from various different sources, and since he could not do anything to get this money, he needed parliament to grant the money to him. Since the taxes he was getting from the barons and rents from his land was not enough. But even this was not enough to run the country. So in 1254, at, the, at his first parliament, Simon de Montfort was forced to call the sheriffs to summon to him two knights from every county elected by the county court, as well as lower, lower clergy. So again, this could be the start of the House of Commons. Whew. Anyway. Simon de Montfort summoned this parliament, which met in one body, mostly supposed to support de Montfort against the great lords who were angry at him. So in order to do this, he had to have the knights and members of the town to back his play. But in doing this, he created a monster, because now the role of knights, as well as the richer townsmen, began to have a larger voice in government. So at the time, a ta knight was one who possessed uh, at least one, if not more, manners, and who was generally involved in the government of his local area, often as sheriff or forest officer. So he now would take on the royal work of his shire as administrator and justice. The knights, they're the big man. They numbered at the time about 1,200 in England. They are the man we see in images in wood and stone in the old churches of England who wear body armor and carry swords and shields as well as the signs of their family. Okay. Because the knights were suddenly preeminent, there is a general stratification in the various ranks and classes below them. By 1350, if not before, there had emerged the outlines of what became known as the gentry, which include knights, esquires, and gentlemen. Now, esquire, that's a prosperous landowner who, for various reasons, had surrendered the rank of knight. A gentleman was of lower status. He simply stood for the head of a landed family. Fifty years later, by 1400, the difference was stated in monetary terms. An esquire earned between 20 and 40 pounds a year. A gentleman earned between 10 and 20 pounds a year. Knights and esquires were allowed to serve as sheriffs and justices of peace. A gentleman could be an undersheriff or a coroner. Gentlemen were always parish gentry. Knights were country gentry. It's interesting that this structure survived with some modification down to the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign. 
It held together in England for more than 500 years. And wherever we look at this time period, we see greater formality and greater control. In the towns of England, there's an oligarchy of the richer merchants in contrast to the royal officialdom. The crafts and merchants were now gathered into guilds and trade associations. The bureaucracy of the king's court is becoming ever more complex, ever more disciplined. Historians have noticed, and are extremely glad, that there are thousands of documents, millions of documents that come down to us from the reign of Henry III. Even the crusaders who left England to go fight in the Holy Land were given written contracts that stated, these are your common terms of service. Every right, every verdict was defined in writing. A royal bailiff who approaches Falls Farmer for taxes, for example, could point out that this is written down in this writ, so the farmer must therefore pay. Even the farmer probably couldn't read the writ, but says, hey, it's right here. There's a paradox that in the reign of a weak or indecisive king like Henry III, that apparatus of the crown had never been more efficient or adaptable. But how else can we explain how Henry, how Henry III, despite the disasters of his government, continued to rule for so long? By decrees, the nation was fixed and made stable despite the manifest tempest upon its surface. Anyway, back to our story. In late May 1265, sorry, 1265, Prince Edward, still in custody, was allowed to go out riding. And for a few days he did. He was always shadowed by guards. But after a few days of establishing, establishing this type of routine, he came out one morning and he complained about the horse he was given. So he tried another horse. And he complained about that horse. And then he tried another horse. And he complained about that horse. Finally, he found a horse he liked and he suddenly galloped off. Having tired all the other horses, no one could catch up with him. He reached the safety of Lud Ludlow Castle. And he raised the standard of his father, declaring he's at war against the Montfort and the other rebels. Now, the Montfort could not allow this threat to stay free. And so, in late July, the two armies marched toward each other, and August 4th met at Evesham in Worcestershire. The Montfort had brought Henry along as a prisoner, and as the battle grew hotter, he and his knights formed a circle around Henry. However, one of the royalists, a knight named Roger Leyburn, managed to get into the circle, snatch Henry, and then fought his way out again. And Prince Edward now released his final weapon, a 12-man death squad, whose only mission is to target the Montfort and kill them, and they were successful in this task. They cut off his head, and he cut off his testicles, and dangled the testicles on each side of his nose before sending the trophy to the wife of the man who beheaded him, which makes me wonder what she thought of this gift. Gee there, thanks. Next time you get a diamond ring. But anyway, after de Montfort died, a general slaughter ensured, where lords and knights, usually granted the right to capture and ransom, were killed. They showed that when Edward would take over the throne one day, he's not going to be the same type of king as his father. The body of Simon de Montfort was handed over to the monks of Esham, and they buried it in their abbey. In the present day, his tomb lies in the ruins of the abbey, beneath the high altar marked by a granite cross. He's become to be seen as a martyr. His burial place has become an object of pilgrimage by Latter-day historians and constitutionalist lovers who admire what, they, what he did to move democracy along in England. His supporters, those who were not slaughtered, slaughtered on the field were scattered. Now some fled at Kenilworth, the castle that belonged to the Montfort family. Others took refuge in the Isle of Eli. Some escaped to the wild woods, and it's possible, possible, that the saga of Robin Hood emerged from the life of one of these wandering rebel lords. And these men would take years to find their way back into the grace of the king, and only at the massive payments of the crown. Henry is now back on his throne, with a great seal and head of his own council. Order was imposed and it was swift. Although, truth to be told, the country had not been much affected by the Civil War barons. Prince Edward felt secure enough that he left England to go and crusade to the Holy Land, preparing himself for the day that he would sit on the throne in the service of Christ. Henry was free to press ahead with the rebuilding of Westminster Abbey, where he really wanted to move the relics of Edward Confessor to a new shrine. The abbey itself is another example of the community of the realm. For 25 years, 800 men worked on the church, 
with new presbytery, a new chapter house, a new crossing, and slowly rising north front. This is the work for the generations. The stone masons of Purebeck, the craftsmen of England, the sailors and wagoners all played their part in this mighty enterprise. Henry lavished much of his treasury he controlled in this building and has become a permanent memorial of his reign. Seven years after the Battle of Esham, King Henry III died on November 16, 1272, of old age. And he's buried at Westminster Abbey, near the tomb of Edward Confessor, where his grave can still be seen. Now, so far, I've looked at the lives and fortunes of the first four kings of the Plantagenet family. In the coming plot podcast, three or four, I will look at Edward I, Edward II, and Edward III, the three Edwards as we know them. Now, I'll examine how England was growing up during the next century to become something that Henry II, Richard I, King John, and Henry III would never have recognized. Stay tuned.